Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for a professional development series presentation, leading through change, maintaining positive morale through times of upheaval. So the Duluth Chamber is incredibly grateful to provide this offering free of charge to our chamber members because of the generosity of our sponsor, the College of St. Scholastica Stender School of Business and Technology. So before I go ahead and introduce our speaker, I'd like to invite Rick Revoir, the, the Dean of Strategic Development and a professor at the college to say a few remarks on behalf of the Stender School of Business and Technology. So, Rick, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and welcome. Thank, thanks for attending. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Rick Revoir. I'd like to thank the Chamber team for offering this series, and the Stender School of Business and Technology at CSS is delighted to, to sponsor the series. Two years ago, uh, you might know, we named our Business and Technology School uh, in honor of Dr. Bruce Stender to recognize his impact on our region through his leadership in a variety of organizations. Um, our school, uh, the Stender School offers face-to-face -face and online degrees in a variety of undergraduate and graduate programs. Uh, ne next year, we're excited to launch a new master's in healthcare administration, and we'll also be launching a master's in nonprofit leadership. Finally, uh, thanks to Sarah Cole for speaking today. Thanks, Rick. Now, at this time, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker, Sarah Cole. Sarah is the first female president and CEO of the Duluth area YMCA. She is a professor of literature and feminist theory, and she is deeply committed to furthering the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, in addition to all of that, our chamber is very proud to also call her a member of our board of directors. So we're really grateful to have you here with us, Sarah. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Cole. Thanks so much. All right, I'm going to share my screen. All right, beautiful. Can you see my screen now? Oh, perfect. I always have to check. You know, as much as as long as this uh, pandemic has been, we always have to check that our technology is working for us. Um, awesome. So it's so great to be here with you all. Um, Buju, uh, hello. Uh, I am I'm Sarah Cole. I am an Ojibwe language learner. Uh, and I've been joking and saying that I have the vocabulary right now of about maybe your average two and a half year old, but always like to take time to acknowledge that we're in, um, we're on Ojibwe land. Um, and I think um, educating ourselves about Ojibwe history and culture and language um, is really powerful. Ojibwe language is an endangered language. And so anything we can do uh, to learn language and to share language and to preserve language is really powerful um, in the midst of change, especially. So um, always, it's just really wonderful to be here. I feel like we could all be talking about this, teaching this, presenting this, because we've had so much change lately. Change is a constant, but it has been on warp speed um, since the pandemic. And I don't even know how many months it's been. I think I've been saying 18, but that's probably dated. So it's probably more than 18 months. It's like 180,000 months. So really good to be with you here today and talking about how we lead through change, which, which we're always doing. And I think at this moment in time, we're especially doing. So um, I told you my name, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I, again, I think as we lead through change and our teams change um, and we focus on inclusivity always, sharing our pronouns is something easy we can do uh, to send a signal of safety and welcome to folks uh, who may be trans or gender non-binary. Um, so it's an easy thing we can all get in the habit of doing. You can even change your Zoom names to include your pronouns as well. So um, just a few little things I think we can keep in mind. So leading through change is about people. It's not just about processes. And that's probably good news, bad news, because uh, people are complicated. So, you know, it is, it really is about the people on our teams and ourselves. And again, I think the bad news about that is it's a lot more compli complex than just talking about processes. Now, processes can also be complex, but people are really complex. My guess is that you find yourself leading teams of folks who are very different um, in many different ways. And so really, you know, how do you create leadership for a team? And then really also that leadership that speaks to individuals on your team as well, not to mention yourself, you're at the center of this. So it really is, I think, um, both an ins inspirational thing to aim for, it's a North Star, 
and it's not going to be easy. So please don't let me make any of this sound overly sexy because it's really hard. It's good stuff, but it's hard, hard stuff. Um, and so I don't want to make it sound too slick. So someone will stop me if I uh, make this all sound too easy in any way. And by the way, you can use the chat box at any time. Uh, this is pretty, we're pretty, I'm easy like Sunday morning today. So if you have thoughts or questions along the way, just say them and I'll leave some time at the end here for questions too, because definitely want to hear what's on your mind. So this, a lot of what I talk about today is not, are, are not my brilliant ideas. They're the brilliant ideas of other people. And a couple of those other people are Chip and Dan Keith, uh, who wrote a really great book called Switch, how to, change, how to Change When Change is Hard. If you haven't read it, it's a really wonderful read. Um, it's, it's not brand new um, and you can probably easily find it. So it's just a great book about some of the things that, it, that change entails. And one of those sort of central metaphors in the book is this idea of the elephant and the rider. And really what we're talking about is the rider, this, the smaller of the two, it's our conscious verbal thinking brain. And the elephant is sort of our, uh, more like our id, our you know, automatic, emotional, visceral brains. And what's so powerful about this is obviously just by looking at this picture, you can tell that one of these two beings is in control and it's not the writer, right? The writer's really little. So the writer does not ultimately have very much chance to control the elephant unless we set things up correctly. And this is how we are, right? This is how our brains work. It's part of the reason that when we get stressed, we tend not to like eat a bowl full of hummus. So we tend to eat a bowl full of chips on our couch while binging Netflix. So that's our elephant, right? So when things are hard, when we're tired, when we're overwhelmed, when we're afraid, elephants run amok. Um, and right now in the midst of COVID and change and loss and fear and stress, there's a lot of elephants running amok all over the place. So you're probably feeling some of this. If you serve customers, you may be sensing or feeling that folks are not as friendly. We're definitely reading about that in the news. Uh, lots of folks losing their, losing their minds on airplanes uh, and behaving badly. You may be getting this. If you serve clients, you may notice that they just don't have as much what feels like emotional bandwidth. Maybe their fuse seems shorter. Maybe you're feeling this way um, after this many months of a lot of change. So there's a lot of elephants right now and they're, they're trampling all over the place. And I think my guess is you're all feeling that in a number of ways. So there's a bunch of studies that have supported this. And one of my favorites is that they took a group of college students and they told them that they were gonna get paid some money to come participate in a study about memory. And there were, I think, 20 students in each group. And group A, they were told that their task was to hear a number, to walk down the hallway and to repeat that number to someone in a different room. And their number was very short, like a three digit number. So they were feeling good. They were not feeling a lot of stress about this task. They were feeling confident that they were gonna be successful. Now, group two, unfortunately, had a number that would be impossible for them to remember. So they have this super, super long number, and they have to do the same task. So they are also tasked with walking down a hallway and repeating their number to someone waiting. And both groups think that that's the purpose of the study. That's why they're there. That's why they're getting their, you know, $20. And in reality though, they're actually there to measure some of their reactions based on stress. So as you can imagine, the group with the short number had less stress, right? They're gonna have success, this is easy. The group with the long number, they've been given a pretty much impossible task. So their stress level is high. Now, each of the folks walks down the hall one at a time. And while they're walking down the hall, they are intercepted by a person pretending to be uh, cleaning up from a meeting that has just ended. And in reality, that person is on the research team. And the person stops them and says, we just ended a meeting and we have some leftover food. Would you like, and their choices are fruit, there's a couple different kinds of fruit, or like cookies. And so the premise is the more stressed out group, right? The group that has elephants that are more in control is going to more often pick cookies. And the group that has riders more in control because they have an easier task, they're less stressed out, is more often going to pick fruit. Sure enough, that's true. So again, you know, we can think about our own behaviors, we can think about the behaviors of our team, and we can think about how all of this is all wrapped up in change. How we do change, how we manage change, how we think about change. And so the Heaths really suggest that some of what we need to do in change is we need to equip the writer 
We need to help manage the elephant and we need to shape the path that they're going to follow. Um, so if we can do that, if we can direct the rider, if we can motivate the elephant and if we can uh, shape the path and the, and the rider and the elephant are working together, we can sort of make change more doable and more pleasant. So um, just think of this. And I think again, it, it rings true to me in terms of where we are right now, but these things are always at play. And again, you've probably seen them in your own life. And I think we can't talk about change and leading through change unless we're really talking about culture. It all boils down to culture. And again, good news, bad news. Good news because I think culture is a really rich area to talk about and focus on. Bad news because culture is not easy. It's not simple. It's not quick to change. Um, it's not something that we can just fix and move on. It's something we have to focus on all the time. So this is a Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and essentially what he means is without culture, if culture is off, nothing else matters. So it doesn't matter how good your strategy is. It doesn't matter how good your product is. It may not matter how good your team is. If you don't have a culture that works, everything else falls apart. So we think again, as we're thinking about change management, how we do it, how we lead through it, how we stay positive, it really is about the cultures that we're creating as well. And just a note about culture is that I think sometimes it's easy to think that the person at the top creates culture, right? CEOs create culture. Really culture is co-created by every single person in our organization. And so if you're sitting there feeling like, well, I see some things about our culture that could change, but I'm not the CEO. Good news, again, bad news maybe, you don't have to be and you don't get off the hook for it. So we all co-create culture together. And so don't ever feel like you can't do that from whatever space you're standing in. There, again, all of us do this together and it's, and it's daily work. So um, another way to say that is, you know, someone else said organizational culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If the breakfast wasn't clear enough for you, uh, it's, there is nothing else. So culture, again, is bigger, can, can make successful or can decimate growth, change, innovation, execution, performance. All of those things come back to organizational culture, um, as does leading change. So um, I just feel like we can't emphasize that too, too much. And then again, when we think about organizational culture, it can feel difficult to define, you know, what is it exactly? Um, a lot of times I think of culture as the water we're swimming in. If we we're all in the ocean, culture is the water. And at times it's, it's imperceptible to us. It feels imperceptible. At time, other times we may be very aware of it. Sometimes we become very aware of it when something is going awry, when something isn't working, or when we feel like our culture is broken or toxic. My guess is a lot of you have maybe had times in your careers where you've worked with or in an organization where culture was broken, and you may really feel that. Um, at other times, we may sort of be unaware of it. So it's an interesting thing. We create it together. Um, it is about our behavior. It, there are subcultures within our larger culture, and maybe you've seen some of that in your workplaces or on your work teams. We shape it together. So not one person, but all of us together shape culture. Um, it's not easy to shape and it's not easy to change. Um, changing or fixing culture uh, can take a lot of time and effort. It's negotiated. So it, they are uh, sort of rules and mores that we come up with together. Again, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. Um, and it's learned through interaction with one another. And again, sometimes you feel culture the most when you change culture. So maybe you've gone into a new workplace or you've had a new team member come on or something, you've gotten a new leader or you've worked with and you've taken over another business. So those can be times when you really become aware of what our culture is. And sometimes we state our cultural values out loud. Most of the time we do not. Uh, but certainly in my mind, all this underpins change, um, how we think about change and how we think about leading change. So um, there's a lot here and I think it's well worth thinking about what your culture is. How would you name it? Um, are they, are the rules implicit or explicit? Do you talk about them? Maybe your, the culture that you're in has shifted over time. That's very possible. Uh, we've all had a lot of workplace changes as a result of COVID. So you may have seen workplace culture shift, um, maybe positively, maybe negatively, maybe neither, maybe just shifted in terms of some of what's expected. Um, some of those things in terms of where we work and how we show up and how we communicate 
have been impacted through COVID. So worth thinking about, and I think worth trying to name because oftentimes we don't explicitly name cultural aspects or cultural aspirations within our workplace. And I think it can be really powerful when we do that because A, we become transparent about what our culture is and B, it helps us to work toward cultural goals. So pretty hard for us to all be on the same page if we're not exactly clear what the same page is in terms of what's expected in our culture. So this is just a couple of examples and maybe you've done the same thing, but I think as we lead through change, it's really important to get clear about what your values are, some of what your brand voice is, and you may use different language for that in your business. So this is just an example. These are our national Y brand values. So we didn't, I didn't make these up. Um, our, these come down from our national YMCA and all YMCAs then, um, you know, have these in place. So our national brand values are caring, honesty, respect, and responsibility. And wise articulate those in a variety of ways, but they are something that is common amongst us. And then we even have some brand personality discussion. So our brand personality is welcoming, genuine, nurturing, hopeful, and determined. And this really should impact the every way we show up, whether it's through our marketing, through the interactions folks have in person, but being really clear, and these don't have to be yours, these might not be your choices, um, but I think some of the ways that we can be, it's really powerful to be clear about what these are in our own businesses. So if we can get really clear, we can also be really clear about, are we leading to these things? So sometimes part of the problem is we might not be leading toward our brand personality or our values or our mission. You may use that language as well. Um, and if so, okay, we can talk about changing leadership. Um, also, it's going to help us know whether we're successful. If we're not exactly sure where we're headed, it's pretty hard to know whether we are ultimately successful in these areas. So I think getting really clear about what our culture is, what our voice is, if you call it your brand voice, your mission statement, your vision statement, um, all of those things are really important. So I would encourage you to be as explicit as you possibly can. Um, this can also really help people acclimatize to your culture. So I early on started um, writing down, I, they became kind of our community guidelines. But I realized that I had a lot of expectations as a leader about some of the ways people in my organization would behave. And I simultaneously realized that I wasn't being explicit about those. I was just sort of assuming that they would understand what I wanted from them um, and deliver it. So I realized that that was pretty problematic. And we now have a set of community guidelines that are some of my expectations for my team members. Um, again, I think, and those are something that we review continually. Um, but it helps me to know that folks are coming in, I'm being equitable in the way that I describe what I want, so I'm not setting folks up so that maybe person A has a clear idea of what I want, but person B doesn't, um, and then person B ultimately isn't successful because they haven't, be, they haven't become aware of what I'm hoping for or expecting. So again, easy thing to do and happy to share ours with you. It, it is not uh, anything magical, but I think if you haven't done that or you're thinking about doing that with your team and maybe even your sub team, you know, your, your small work group team, I think it's really powerful. You can also create those in community. And I think that's a great way to exercise sort of team leadership about what we're all hoping for. And maybe those things evolve over time, but I think it evens the playing field in a really nice way to sort of talk about who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and even what some of our expectations might be that have traditionally gone unsaid. And then of course, again, this is just an example from our business, but I really like to explain to folks what this leadership is going for. You know, what, why does all this matter? Um, and so I like to say, okay, our cause and our culture results in the following. Um, because obviously I feel like I have to draw a clear line between what we're expecting and what we're leading toward and business results. And I often think those things go hand in hand more than they don't. So, so many times I feel like when we're leading in a powerful, positive way, we're actually leading toward the things we want, whether it's serving more folks, making more money, creating more partnerships, giving folks a, the best possible customer service experience they can have, uh, attracting and retaining talent, because I think, you know, this is a big part of the puzzle in terms of how we get and keep smart, thoughtful, intelligent, 
evolving people. So I always want to draw that line for folks. Why does this matter? You know, and so for us this past year, we kind of had four uh, buckets that I thought this mattered in. And again, this is just my way of talking to some of our team members about where we're leading, what we're going toward. You know, in the metaphor of the elephant, this would be clearing the path, you know, becoming, being really clear about what this is all in service to. And it matters, you know, in fact, it matters more than anything else because without our cause and culture, we don't have any of these results. And I would say also then we just don't have a business. So, you know, I think it's really wonderful when those business and those ethical implications overlap in a big way. And I think they so often do. And I think this is stuff that hasn't changed. Some of the ways that we've delivered have changed through COVID, some of the mechanisms, some of the delivery systems, um, but these basic things have not changed. We still want amazing people on our team. We still wanna have impeccable service and spaces. We obviously wanna still have long-term financial sustainability. Um, in fact, maybe that's, that's become more clear than ever. We wanna have local and national opportunities for all of our folks in our business. And again, this is just one more example of naming these things. So how we start to name what our culture is and we let folks know that right away. So when we're interviewing folks, we're talking about this. When folks are getting onboarded, it's really clear, important that folks are clear about what we're expecting as a part of our culture, what we are all pledging service to and dedication to, and what we expect our team members to also be a part of. Um, and so big thanks, um, believe it or not, Netflix has a great culture deck. Um, and a lot of these were articulated really well in their culture deck. So if you're interested in a really great culture deck, Netflix happens to have one, um, which you can find online. So really this helped us get clear about what kind of behaviors, what kind of buckets we really valued in our culture. And again, that's just about being clear. There's no right or wrong answers. Yours may not look like these, or you may have some similar ones. They may be totally different. But being honest and upfront about what we're expecting positions us for success as leaders and positions the folks who are working with us and for us for success as well. And of course, we know that one of our biggest headaches lately, staffing, that we're hearing all about and every day I feel like I'm reading tons of articles about um, work culture and why folks are leaving and will they ever come back and where are they, is really about this sort of happiness that is often about leadership. And you've probably heard sayings like people don't quit jobs, they quit managers. Um, or of course, statistically, even though um, we definitely have room to grow in terms of wage, we know that less than 50% of people leave jobs because of money. Um, in fact, they often want to stay at companies where they're recognized for their accomplishments, they can express themselves and be part of conversations, that they feel valued in their contributions. Um, that they feel comfortable being themselves at their work, that they feel like there's good communication and transparency from leadership, they feel like they're cared about, um, they feel like they're in a community of different folks, including folks who look like them. So again, to me, uh, there's good news and bad news here. The good news is there's rich ground here to dig into. Um, and what we've always told ourselves is true, that it's, it's usually not money. Um, and the difficulty or the bad news is, I think this is really complicated stuff. And some of it can take a very long time to change and evolve, um, which you probably felt if you've ever tried to change or evolve culture, if you've ever come into culture and tried to be a change agent. So I do think, you know, as much as this is all wrapped up together, including in how do we get and keep people? Um, and just in our business, as in all of yours, that might be the most fundamental question. If we can't get and keep good people, we cannot provide service. We cannot form partnerships. We cannot be innovative. Nothing else works if we can't keep people and keep people excited. And then of course, you know, this whole model of engagement, which again is about culture and how we lead toward culture. Um, moving from, you know, employees that you might have that you know are disengaged all the way up through folks who are highly engaged and just how much that matters. So again, I think when we talk about creating culture, when we talk about leading through change, a lot of that has tremendous impact on where folks fall in this range, um, whether they feel disengaged, whether they feel so highly engaged that nothing would ever shake them. I ran into one of our employees the other day and he said to me, I'm a lifer. I want to work here till I'm old and gray. And that made me so happy. I, it just totally made my whole month. You know, I felt like, oh yes, that's exactly how I want all my employees to feel. That they love working here, that they, there will always be room for them to grow, that they're valued, 
um, that they can be excited when they come to work, that they can be challenged, but also rewarded. Um, and it's definitely not the case that all of our employees feel that way, but it was a great reminder that I think if we can lead through change effectively, we can get more of that. And we've also felt the results of, of that in the opposite way, which is that there are folks who feel like we haven't led perfectly through change and we've lost some of those people. You know, they felt either angry or disengaged or unvalued. Um, and certainly we had to make some hard decisions during COVID, my guess is a lot of you did, um, that may have inadvertently left folks feeling that way, but it definitely has had an impact on who we have in our spaces um, and we've lost people because of that. So to me, it's always a great uh, a measure too, you know, how engaged are folks and there are great ways we can find this out, right? We can do quick surveys. We can do stay interviews. So many of you probably do exit interviews when folks quit. There's been a ton of research suggesting that a much better use of our time and energy would be to do stay interviews. So rather than interview people when they're breaking up with us, which is a lot like asking someone going through a breakup with you how you are as a partner, we can ask people who are happy, why they're happy and engaged. We can ask people why they're staying in our business and we can get a lot of great information and data out of those stay interviews, um, which sometimes we don't get nearly as effectively through exit interviews. And of course I have this in here and I know for folks who've been on uh, trainings with me before, we've done a lot of work with this. This is, we just call this the diversity wheel at the Y. It is an imperfect tool that aims to create a visual for all of the dimensions of diversity that we might have ourselves as individuals. It has blank spaces because it acknowledges that there might be aspects of your identity that are not represented on here, but should be. So I love the fact that the tool sort of acknowledges its own imperfection. But what I think is, is important here is that in this leadership that we're talking about, right, how we lead through hard times, how we lead positively, how we create good culture or co-create good culture as leaders, we are also, we're at the center, just like we are in this diagram. And we're not at the center of things because we're more important than anyone else or we're, or we're more impressive or we have bigger titles or whatever. We're at the center of this because we're all at the center of our own experience. So um, you've probably heard the saying, you don't see things as they are, you see things as you are. And you've also probably had the experience of having a, being in the same situation as someone and having a completely different experience of that situation or memory. If you have siblings, usually you have many of these from growing up where you remember things one way, your sibling remembers things a different way. And we, again, we are reflecting the world through our own history and experiences. And it's no different with our leadership. So I think just to remember that um, our leadership is impacted by the ways that we've been led, has been impacted by some of the way, things that we've seen in the world, maybe impacted by things like racism, sexism, um, homophobia, um, long-term genocide. There, there are lots of things that impact sort of who we are and how we move through the world. And those things all impact our leadership. I think we're doing a better job talking about that lately and really imagining sort of how that viewpoint and the lenses that we come to with our leadership can impact the way we're leading. So it's, there's nothing to be done about that. You are the center of your own experience, but being aware of it is really helpful. Um, and I think as we all attempt to be more diverse and more inclusive in our leadership and create greater equity and justice, it's really important to be aware of our own lenses, whatever they are in our own experiences. Not for the sake of feeling guilty about them if you find yourself in a space of safety or privilege, but for the sake of opening up spaces of safety and privilege for everyone. So um, I think it's really important to see ourselves there. And of course, just remember that in our leadership, not only are you, do you have all these dimensions, but every single person you're leading on your team has all these dimensions too. So um, again, that's a really beautiful, complicated thing um, that may impact the way that your team deals with change, right? Um, some of their history and experiences, some dimensions of their identity may make change more or less scary, more more or less exciting, um, even your positionality in your workplace. Um, some of you were the maybe face layoffs or cutbacks in your jobs and had to deal with that fear. And some of you were the ones making those really horrific decisions behind closed doors. Um, and that's its own form of trauma as well. So just kind of centering ourselves again, um, you know, liberation, as they say, is an inside job. So the more we can be clear about who we are and what we know, the more we can be aware of the lenses that we carry with us as well. 
So again, good news, bad news here. So about change, um, this is, and this is Heath, Chip and Dan Heath work. What looks like a people problem is often a situation problem. So when we feel like folks are resistant to change, and I think we have a lot of discourse out there, and sometimes we're, I've been guilty of, of doing it too, where we have a lot of negatives about change. Like we say things like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks and change is hard and change is scary. Um, and those things can be true, but I think also change can be exciting. I used to work with someone who said, change isn't hard. If, if I gave you a million dollars right now, that wouldn't be hard for you. You'd be excited, but it'd be a change. So she was, she would always make me laugh because I thought, okay, well, that's true. So a lot of times um, we assume that people are resistant or um, lazy, or they're just not on board. Again, a lot of times what looks like a people problem is a situation problem. And um, Chip and Dan Heath talk a lot about just people being tired. Change is tiring. I think it's the reason that, um, I think that that's the story of why some folks like Steve Jobs always wore the same thing. Because he knew the fewer changes he had, the fewer decisions he had to make every day, uh, the sharper he was. So the, if he could cut down his wardrobe decision, that was one less decision that that rider had to make. And that rider could therefore sort of keep its power and keep its attention. So we make tons of choices every day and all the studies um, tell us that that's exhausting. They actually tell us that the more choices we have sometimes, the less likely we are to actually make a change or make a decision. So this is studied a lot in grocery stores. When we give folks them a million choices about jelly, Turns out they're paralyzed. They can't make a decision. Turns out six choices about jelly is the right number of choices. And then they can make a choice about what kind of jelly they want. But we're in a world where we have an increasing amount of decisions, um, including in our businesses and in our leadership. So sometimes what looks like a people problem, what looks like resistance or a bad attitude is really a situation problem. The situation's scary. The situation is overly complex. Maybe we've given people too many choices. Maybe we haven't communicated clearly. Um, again, so as I mentioned, what looks like laziness is often exhaustion. So sometimes it's easy as a leader to spearhead a change with your team and you just don't get a lot of immediate follow through or reaction. And if you're me, one of your first internal reactions can be frustration. Like, come on, this is such a great idea. Why are people not behind it? And in reality, sometimes people are not behind it because they're exhausted. I think this especially resonates during the 1000 months of COVID that we've all been in because people are exhausted. They're exhausted because their kids are home and they're exhausted because they're scared about their health and maybe they've lost people in their lives to COVID. Maybe their day-to-day -day joy and activity has been modified because they can't go out to dinner as easily or go to the movies or see their families. Maybe they've missed huge family events. Maybe they've lost jobs. Maybe they've just found themselves in an uncertain world and they really are exhausted. So I think sometimes if we can be aware that there might be a different lens there, that leading through change can be remembering that people might be really tired and that sometimes what we're seeing as a lack of buy-in or disinterest is really tiredness, exhaustion. Um, what looks like resistance is often lack of clarity. So again, um, easy to be frustrated and maybe more difficult to think, have I been really clear about what exactly I want from this change? Or have I been really clear about what exactly I want of our culture? Have I been really clear about how I want us to show up and how I expect us to show up? Has that been clear? Or did I just think I was clear and in reality, folks are confused out there? So really important, I think, that we think about that and get lots of feedback. Uh, because a lot of times, of course, what I think and say seems clear to me. Um, and many times I find out that I haven't said that aloud or I haven't telegraphed that as clearly as I think I have. So super important to get a lot of feedback about that. And of course, for anything to change, someone has to start acting differently, right? So, um, and it might be you uh, as the team leader or the spearheader of this change. It might be someone else because sometimes we're the impetus to change. Sometimes we are members of the change group. Uh, and to change someone's behavior, you've got to change that person's situation. So um, now we're back to that rider and the elephant. How can we make change easy, the easiest we possibly can for folks? So how do we lead through this? seemingly never ending change. And I think it is never ending. I think even before COVID and even post COVID, whatever that is, we will all be in a world that is continually evolving and changing. Um, so I think some of the things we have to do are be willing to think again, 
So how do we not fall too much in love with our own ideas about change and leadership and initiatives and be really willing to get feedback, to solicit feedback, and then to listen to some of that feedback um, about these types of initiatives that we're doing or our own leadership. Of course, we're going to have to revise. I'm a Brene Brown fan, and she uh, says, we're not here to be right. We're here to get it right. And I really love that. So we're not here to be right. We're here to get it right. So that really, it takes the, the pressure off to get everything right the first time perfectly and puts us more in a growth mindset. Um, that we're going to have failures, we're going to have challenges, and that's okay. We can fail forward into getting it right. I think that's a really powerful place to be. However, it also means we have to be willing to accept feedback about how we haven't gotten it right, and to see that feedback as a real act of community. So we don't give feedback to folks we don't want to be in community with. We just leave or we just check out. If folks give us feedback about our leadership, about our business, about our culture, I think it's really important that we get in a space to take that feedback um, and to try to get it right. We need to over communicate. I, it, you may be guilty of this too. I, I think still am under communicating, especially in times of change. Um, I read somewhere someone said, if you, if you aren't tired of hearing yourself say it by the end of the day, you haven't communicated it enough. And I think we just have to over communicate, especially in times of uncertainty and change. And we might have to communicate in sort of multimodal ways. So we may need to say things. We need to, maybe need to email things. We may need to say things in smaller groups. We may need to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. We may need to have Q&A sessions. So what are the variety of ways in which we can communicate this change and why this change might be happening? I think that transparency can be really comforting to folks, especially if change feels scary. And it often does to, to folks, especially if they feel like they're not in charge of the change. Don't waste a good crisis. So not to make light of COVID, COVID has been wretched. Um, and also I think we have learned through it. So I hold both things that this has been a really difficult time for, for us collectively and for us individually and for many of our businesses. And at the same time, I think it's been a tremendous opportunity to really prove that we can do hard things that we can continue leading and serving through really uncertain times, that we can share things with each other, that we can lean on one another. So I think that that uh, I would hate to close COVID, hopefully soon, without really feeling like we had made some growth in terms of how we're leading. We can shrink the change. That's, again, that's a switch language. And the idea is if we can make things simpler, folks are less tired. So how do we make decisions easier for folks. Um, an example with the jam is one, although you can't control how many jams are in the grocery store. Um, but when we can shrink change, so we, we can shorten the distance that people have to go, we can make things easier. Um, one, again, I think being clear about our culture, explicitly clear, is shrinking the change. We're giving folks really clear ideas about what we want. In fact, we're telling them, hey, this is the culture that we've agreed to. Uh, we're being upfront and transparent about that. They don't have to do the legwork of trying to figure that out in small, subtle ways. So what are the ways that if you have a big change project, you can shrink the steps? And of course, we know that all big change is just a series of steps anyway. So this is just the way the world works. Um, but you know, if you're implementing a new software system, that can feel like a huge change. What are some of the smaller parts? There may be learning sessions. There may be opportunities for people to engage with the technology in small spaces. There may be sandboxes that you build out for people to play with. But how do we really shrink that into small steps so that folks can feel success and not just feel the overwhelm of a huge mountain of change in front of them? You know, rather than saying things like, we really need to change our culture, we can say things like, you know, I'd like to have more gratitude in our culture. I'm going to write a thank you note to someone every Friday. It's going to take a few minutes, maybe not more than five. Simple, doesn't cost a lot of money. That's something I'm going to do to think about how I can increase gratitude in our particular culture. Much smaller, much more of a smart goal than uh, change culture, but certainly as part of changing culture. We can celebrate successes and find bright spots. Um, you know, how has this worked in the past? We can really celebrate anecdotes about the way change has worked. We can celebrate our own change leadership. Again, I think COVID has given us a lot of opportunities to point to things for our team and say, hey, I never thought we would be able to survive fill in the blank. Um, at the Y, we closed down our fitness facilities. I don't know if there's been a period in history where YMCAs have operated without access to their fitness facilities, but we did. So, you know, again, if we can do that, that's major change. 
um, then really we can do change. We don't have to be afraid of change. We've had success with change. Um, so having sometimes those small wins and making sure to really celebrate them is a great way to lead through ongoing change and to make people feel rewarded and excited about change rather than overwhelmed or fearful. And of course, we're going to have failure. So I like that idea of failing forward. I think as adults, we can get a little bit rigid about failure. We're great at telling kids that they need to fail in order to learn and that it's okay to fail in order to learn. We get a little bit more uptight and rigid about that as adults, I think, because the stakes feel higher. But if we can do that and model that as leaders, that's a really powerful thing. We are not going to have change without failure and revision. And if we can sort of illustrate that ourselves as leaders and in our workplace and talk about those failures and even celebrate some of them um, as sort of impetus to move forward and fail better, as they say, I think that's a really powerful thing. And, and um, these all come from a great article called Leading Change, 10 Ways Great Leaders Make Change Happen, which was a Tracy Bauer article from Forbes. Um, I think these are all really important too. How can we be authentic? You know, really sharing some of our thoughts and feelings in the midst of change. And those aren't always going to be positive, inspirational feelings. Um, of course, though, we do have to be inspirational. I think as leaders, we're often um, kind of like leading toward that lighthouse, right? I think of us as, as leading toward the light or sometimes being the lighthouse. We can be that beacon of hopefulness in times where things feel scary. We're leading towards sort of that positive aspirational goal or goals that our businesses and companies have. We have to be visible. Um, literally, you know, I know that again, maybe that's changed during COVID, but there's lots of ways we can be visible, but we have to be visibly open to doing change ourselves um, and modeling some of that, that's powerful. Of course, we have to be inclusive. I don't think there's anything that can happen anymore without a real specific attention to the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. How are we really being thoughtful about that in all of those dimensions that, I, that, that we looked at a few slides ago? That's really key. We have to be super clear because elephants and riders can't work together unless they know where they're headed. So when elephants and riders are clear about where they're headed and they're excited, there's a pretty much nothing that can stop them. When they're going, when they want different things, then chaos ensues. So, you know, if we can be really clear about what we want, we can measure success as well. And I think that's huge for the sake of celebration. We can be proactive and think ahead to what's coming. Again, I think uh, COVID forced us all to be reactive, but I think we're moving back into a space where we can be proactive about some of the things that we want to achieve and some of, maybe some of the ways we want to be different coming out of this. Of course, we can be educational. This is a learning process for everyone. Uh, we have to be dedicated to our own continual learning and growth as leaders. And we have to be dedicated to creating opportunities and pathways for leadership growth for those folks on our teams as well. We have to be measured. This one is not my strong suit. I'm a more is more kind of person, but especially when we're talking about change, um, and, and folks are perhaps likely to be overwhelmed, it's really important to think strategically about how we roll out change, how we talk about change, how we over communicate change, and that can, can, it can necessitate an aspect of being measured, although I'm still learning how to do that. Um, we can be reinforcing, again, I think celebrating folks for taking risks. Celebrating folks, even sometimes for having failure in this for the for the sake of change. Um, and we can be evolving. We can just understand that as soon as we think we understand this, it's of course going to change for us. And I think um, I said leadership is a team sport, or if you're as nerdy as me, it's like a team, it's a math league or something. I don't want to uh, leave my fellow nerds out of this. Um, I've never actually successfully played a team sport, but I have been on a debate team. So whatever metaphor works for you in terms of teams. I think it's just so important that we find our own teams as leaders, um, spaces like this, but what are our support systems? It can be very lonely to do leadership period. It can be especially lonely to lead through times of change. So really just making sure that each of us has a support system. Um, we can create opportunities for joy and play. And I think that's huge, both for our teams and for ourselves. Um, I think to me, I notice in myself when I haven't been playing enough or having enough joy, because I get pretty brittle and it's just so important. I know some of those ways maybe I still have to be modified for the sake of safety, but what are the things that bring you joy um, and how do you do them? And also how do you create space to do them with your teams? We're always gonna feel too busy, uh, but 
if we can't play together, we're never going to be able to go through hard things together. Um, I think sometimes the relationships that we build through play and being playful with one another are the things that sustain us and build trust for when times are hard. How do we express gratitude? I feel like this is something we can't do enough to verbally, in writing, uh, with small gifts, with promotional opportunities, just how do we make sure that we're being explicitly thankful to everyone around us for what they're doing? I think that's so huge. It's something that I think there's always more room for. Of course, we have to lead by example. How are we doing these things ourselves? Um, diversify staffing teams is, again, how do we create the most diverse, strong teams possible? The more viewpoints we have on our team, the more history, the more experience, uh, the more passions, the stronger we are as a team. So as we think about building our teams, um, again, diversity, equity, and inclusion, is, they aren't just buzzwords. They really do make our teams stronger and better. And you know, I think we can provide continual opportunities for growth. That's really big to me. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, but how are we thinking about that for our teams? And of course, the V word, not that V word, if you were thinking of that, but the V word to me is vulnerability. And it is a scary, enticing word um, because I think it is key. I see it, it's so powerful when I see other leaders doing it. And yet I, when I do it, I feel terrified and a little bit sick. So I know though, that's a good sign to me that I'm in a good leadership space is if I feel a little bit nauseous about it, I'm, I'm in a growth, I'm on my growth edge. So I think that we're really gonna have to illustrate and practice vulnerability as leaders. And again, good news, bad news. I think the good news is, man, this is powerful. If you've seen people do this, I don't know that there's anything more powerful. The bad news is it's scary um, and it's gonna feel scary. So I think there's some ways we can get better at this, kind of flex the muscles. I think we can practice in small, safe places. Um, you know, how can we test this out in spaces with folks we know in spaces with folks we feel that we have trusting relationships with? Um, we can recognize that there's allies and confidants. And um, you may have folks who are your allies but are not your confidants. And, uh, you know, be aware of sort of who you can share your innermost thinking about these types of things with and who maybe you have to be a little bit more guarded with. I think it's worth thinking about different roles that people play in our lives, our professional lives. Your context and your history matter. So I don't, I would never want to tell folks to be vulnerable without recognizing that this means a different thing if you're a person of color. This means something different if you're a woman, if you're someone in the queer community. Um, there's been higher stakes for vulnerability. I think men carry their own baggage here in terms of uh, societal expectations that they are never vulnerable. So just to, I, I wanna acknowledge that because this is not an easy thing and it's not always safe. I think it's important to realize not all spaces are safe spaces to practice vulnerability, but when we have the safety to practice it, it creates more safety for other folks to practice it. Um, risk v reward, of course, it's not without risk. I think the reward of practicing authentic vulnerable leadership is tremendous. It encourages our the, those around us to practice authentic, you know, flexible, vulnerable leadership. And that's a hugely powerful thing. Um, in fact, I think it might be the most powerful thing in terms of our leadership. So if we're going to crack that door open for other folks, how can we do that ourselves? It gives us great amplification opportunities. So um, when we see other people doing this, we can thank them, we can acknowledge them, in our spaces of leadership and with what power we have, we can practice this and we can reward other people for practicing it. We can just talk about it. You know, that in and of itself, I think, um, changes the dynamic of leadership. And I think creates new maps of leadership in really exciting ways. Um, we can celebrate our success when we do do it, even though you might get a little bit of a vulnerability hangover the next day and think to yourself, okay, did that work as well as I thought it did? Did that resonate with folks? And my experience has been that when I've done that, um, it's always been a good experience after the fact that folks have always um, appreciated that and it's always led to good things. And then of course, again, just recognizing our own dimensions of diversity within this and our own experiences. There may be times that this feels safe. There may be times that it feels too risky for our own self-preservation. Um, and that's okay too. I think that we can create some space here and we create some new maps of leadership um, 
that are different than some of the former maps and maybe different than some of the maps we've been handed. Um, it's really intriguing to me to think about these new and more inclusive, more vulnerable ways of leading, uh, but they're certainly not the ways that I've been led. So uh, it can feel like I'm in uncharted territory or kind of creating a new map, but I think we can work together to create some new maps to places that we want to go. So I said that I would um, I'll just I'll stop sharing maybe and so I can see all your faces and um, have a little time. I think we have like 10 minutes for questions if that works for folks. Well, there you are. It always feels a little strange when I can't see anyone and then I can, <laughs> can see some of you again. I'm gonna pop on quick and say, Sarah, I really appreciate your point of um, don't waste a good crisis. I think all of us have been through so much change in the last year and a half, like you've mentioned, that to be able to, to look back even now while we're still kind of in it um, and say the things that worked and the things that didn't work have been valuable. You know, like we've had to adapt many of our events um, and, and looking into the future, like what worked and what didn't. So we are, the chamber is at least kind of utilizing the opportunity and the things that we've learned um, and how to implement change moving forward. So you mentioned so many great points. That's just one of them. But yes, if you have any questions, please just pop on a video. You can ask Sarah or you can type it in a chat if that's more comfortable for you. And we can um, we can move forward there. Yeah, Chris, I love that you mentioned that too, because again, I think many of our businesses have done things we never thought we could do. You know, if I told you two years ago that you would have to make all your stuff virtual and you would, I mean, if you told me two years ago that we'd have to move our equipment and shut our buildings and um, I, it would have just seemed impossible. So I think it's just great to remind ourselves, especially when we're feeling tired or burned out, we've done this, we've already done it. We've already proven to ourselves that we can do it in really extreme circumstances. So everything else should be easier and hopefully that makes us feel brave. I like that so much. Thank you. <laughs> I really like the di diversity wheel. It was visually helpful to see that. So <clears throat> think about it. Yeah, I love that image. You know, I think sometimes it really just gives great language to all the different elements of diversity, right? And um, sometimes I'll work with a community that says, we don't have a lot of diversity. And I'll say, we'll say more. Um, because every community has diversity. So do you mean you would like more racial diversity, more ethnic diversity, more diversity in socioeconomic status? That really helps us be really specific about what we're talking about and hopefully acknowledge all of our own various dimensions of diversity and the dimensions in our teams and in our, in our cities and in our state, whatever group we're thinking of as well. So I always find it's a really helpful um, to language tool and we can get really specific and we can think about some of our own dimensions and how they may be impacting our leadership. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, you know, this session has been recorded and we will place it on, um, on our website for you to stream. If you'd want to go back, share it, rewatch it, please do so. Um, Sarah, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you so much. And Rick, thank you so much to the Stender School of Business and Technology for sponsoring. This was another wonderful series and um, we appreciate all that you bring to the table, Sarah. So thank you. No, always a joy to be with you. And as you mentioned, it's it's not a speak now or forever hold your peace. So folks know where to find me and big thanks to Rick and to the chamber, to you, Chris, for putting this all together and uh, just for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics. So always wonderful to spend time in community with all of you. You bet. Well, thanks, Sarah. And thank you all for attending. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks.